Okay, everybody, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. So um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Joel Larson. I'm the Associate Director at the Water Resources Center here. Um, we were talking earlier that until we perfect human cloning, Jeff can't be in two places at once, otherwise he would be here um, introducing John. Jeff will be joining us in a few minutes. He just has a meeting that ends um, right about now. So in the meantime, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Freshwater or the um, Headwaters Lecture Series. John is the Executive Director of Freshwater in a position he started in March of this year. He's had a long career in project, protecting the natural resources of Minnesota and the health of its citizens. Most recently, he served as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and he's also worked for many years at the State Department of Health and Department of Natural Resources. He is an alum of the University of Minnesota, yes. so it's great to have him back again. And John will be talking about water governance in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lives. So please join me in welcoming John Linkstein. Welcome. We got to dim the lights. I, well, thank you, everyone, and welcome. And uh, I, I, I confess, you're my. Uh, uh, this is the maiden voyage of this presentation for me. So I, uh, I look forward to your thoughts and your feedback as I, as I talk about something that is near and dear to my uh, career, uh, which is the water law in Minnesota. And are we really the land of ten thousand laws? Uh, let's see how we're going to advance. That's a great question. Not yet. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what you're going to hear about today. You're going to hear plenty of water law history, not so much about the law itself, but about the conditions and some of the events that led to our laws. Uh, I'm going to cover the law not purely from a, a sequential uh, evolution. I'm going to talk about the topics that our legislature in this state has decided to address and how they came to be. Things like what are waters of the state, what are public waters, what are waters of the United States, uh, how, our drain, how drainage and buffering of uh, our waterways came uh, to be uh, defined and, and to be regulated, regulations pertaining to natural resource conservation water use, public health and sanitation, safe drinking water. I'm gonna talk about the environmental awakening period, uh, which was uh, the early part of my life. Now it doesn't seem so long ago, but it was a while back. Uh, how Uncle Sam got involved more and more in Minnesota's water law, the clean water legacy, uh, which came about in the early 2000s, how local government plays a part in, in groundwater. And even with all that, you're getting about 50 to 60% of our state's water law in this presentation. I'm only focusing on the stuff that's actually about water governance, not talking about aquatic invasive species, not talking about interstate or national uh, relationships related to water governance. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of water uh, regulatory or water law uh, that you won't be hearing about today. So I apologize, that lecture would be a lot longer. How complex is it, really? Let's, let's talk about this. If you take chapter 103 to 114, which is referred to in our statutes as Minnesota's water law, it is 431 pages, 232,000 words, plus or minus. And you could say that our water laws are complex. So I'm sure you're saying, well, how could any one person ever know that? And the answer is you have to work for 40 years and then you're qualified to talk about 50 to 60% of it. <laughs> but I wanna start before the era of water laws began because before there were water laws, there were people living here that respected the water. There were people all over the state of Minnesota, indigenous people, Dakota people, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe people who had great respect and who came to have uh, various tri, uh, tribal governments and treaties that were to respect their interest in water and natural resources. I'm not going to go into this today, but you should never have this conversation about water law 
without first hearing about indigenous people's relationship with water. We view water, Western society, the settlers, if you want to call it that, or if you're thinking about native culture, you'd say the invaders, created a view of water as a commodity, as a resource, as a thing. In most indigenous cultures, water is a relative. Water is not something you can commoditize. You cannot put value on it because it would be like asking yourself, what's the value of my aunt or my uncle or my neighbor or my friend or the earth itself or the creative spirit that brought us all together. So I wanna just be mindful and respectful of the people that came here before us. And especially, I have learned so much from the Anishinaabe about their uh, mission, their call to leave the eastern part of this continent and travel west to the place where food grows on the water. They came to this part of the country of the continent because rice grew on the water. It was prophetic. It was spiritually profound to them to move west from the eastern part of our continent because they were told to do so by the, by the spirit. So their culture says, this is not just something they use for food. This is something that they were guided and directed to come and utilize for the furthering of their culture, of their spiritual beliefs, and of their people. So I just want to honor and respect them for their way of life, for their connection uh, to water that is much richer than uh, anything I could ever say about 160 or 170 years of water governance in the state of Minnesota. First of all, let's remember about Minnesota's water. Just this is a room full of people who know many of these facts, but I feel compelled to make sure you all hear them once again. Minnesota's water, it's our water, nobody else's water. We are, this is a headwaters lecture. We're a headwaters state, we are headwaters. Less than 2% of the water that leaves our state came from someplace else. So when we look in our communities, in our watersheds, in our groundwater systems, the water of Minnesota is Minnesotans water. And by the way, what does that mean? 11 million acres plus or minus of wetlands, that's less than half of what was originally here, pre-settlement by Westerners. Uh, 11,854 lakes, not 10,000, not 15,000. Uh, and that is 11,854 that are greater than 10 acres in area and average depth more than five feet. The DNR will tell you that's an exact number. And so when people ask you how many lakes are in Minnesota, 11,854. 90,000 miles of streams and waterways, 80 watersheds at the Huck 8 scale, and groundwater was almost impossible. I didn't even try to quantify it because every estimate of quantity is wrong, uh, but it has got some great assets and some challenges. It's plentiful in the southeastern part of the state and the central part of the state, and it has its limitations in the northeast, the southwest, and the northwestern part of our state. Water was first understood uh, by Western civilization in, the North, in North America and the United States because of the government land office surveys. How many of you have ever seen a government land office survey? You've seen one. You know what? They're interesting. They were, they were done by private surveying companies. The government hired them. The government had a crew. The crews involved timbermen someone to cut down trees, chainmen, meaning someone to drag the 80 link chain that was uh, dragged throughout the landscape and a compassman and a rodman. So the idea of a government land survey was to block out the landscape and describe it so that the land could be orderly developed and promoted for uh, for development. This happens to be a copy of the government land office survey of the estuary of the St. Louis River near Duluth. It is, it shows you uh, a little bit of the nature of the 
of the maps that were produced, they're part survey, part art. It's more of a cartographic um, depiction when they came to water. Because if they came to water, especially if they came to water they couldn't cross, they meandered. It was a formal term, meaning you would set a post and you would start angling from those posts to the next post and you would set a post every time you had to meander. They tried to follow what was a logical line. Many people have misconstrued that a meander line meant that there was water on one side and no water on the other side. That's false. The survey crews set points and followed a meander line that made sense for surveying. So many debates in my past life for surveyors and for land, uh, for land use were based on whether or not a body of water was meandered. That meant that, it had, that you could not cross it with the chain. If they could cross it with the chain, they dragged the chain through the swamp to the other side. I don't have facts on the number of surveyors that were lost in the process of uh, the original government land office survey. The government land office survey began in 1796 and it was wrapped up around 1900. It's now part of the Bureau of Land Management. There's still a government land office surveyor position and it's in the Bureau of Land Management. Let's take a step back and talk about what waters what do we mean? What, the definition of waters has changed over time. Swamps, wetlands, marshes were not considered waters. In the 1800s, they were considered wastelands. They were considered places to be improved. And so the first term that really was uh, utilized heavily in, in our laws, both in the nation and in Minnesota, were navigable waters. They had to meet a test of navigability, it had to be used for some commercial purpose, Usually there was some kind of a court case that demanded uh, that we define what a navigable water is. Meandered lakes came up during the uh, government, original government land office surveys. Public waters was first defined in state statute in 1897. Public waters meant waters of the state of Minnesota in which the government had an interest. They included meandered lakes, they included navigable waters. The, Congress got involved in defining waters of the United States in the 1899 uh, Rivers and Harbors Act, section 10 of that law, where they declared that no one could obstruct or otherwise uh, impair through construction of a bridge, a crossing, a pier, a wharf, or any other object, navigable waters of the United States. Waters of the state, became defined in 1937. I'll say a little bit more about this, why it was at that time. It, it was the first time that we added the concept of underground waters as waters of any regulated sense. And then the public waters inventory was done in 1976. And this is an example. My first job at DNR, one of my first jobs when I was a young DNR a student worker was to look at these county highway maps. This is what we did and you'll notice that the map is wrong because it's laying on its side, even though the legend is uh, one way. Todd County, that's, this is the south end of Todd County, and that's the north end, because it just fit on the sheet of paper. That's the way the county highway map was laid out, and that's the way we did the map. We took blue ink and drew on county highway maps to make the first public water inventory maps. My first job here at the university was to map out peatlands of the of the northern Minnesota and we used plat books and colored pencils with uh, stereo paired aerial photographs to decide what was peat and what was not. So in my lifetime, that was technology in my lifetime. So just by way of reference, but this is what a public waters inventory looked like. It was solely for the sake of defining what waters were regulated under the DNR's permitting authority for public waters permits. More about that later. As I said, you're going to bounce around a little bit by interest as we go today. Governor to be Alexander Ramsey, who was my, my high school, where I went to high school in Roseville, Minnesota, Alexander Ramsey High School, said that 
we would be a far better off society with more productive lands and less disease if we just would drain the wetland. That was the state's actual first policy, was to promote drainage. Drainage by excavation and subsurface tiling. Now, this is one of the most interesting laws and one of the longest sections of the law that's been in place that came to be in 1883. It was amended multiple times all the way throughout my career to address many different subjects. But it, the subject that Minnesota has organized drainage law is really impacted the landscape of our state. And many would say for the better, some would say for the worse. There are many arguments to be made on both sides. But let's just, I just want you to understand what drainage law actually allows. It allows neighbors to come together and impose an action on other neighbors. Utilizing a quasi jurisdiction, governmental jurisdiction called a public drainage authority that can actually condemn some of your rights to use your land in certain ways and force you to accept a drainage system that you may not otherwise want or that others may not otherwise want. The purpose of the drainage law was to provide for a uniform authority to make this happen. And it really goes back to this statement. We need to drain the wet land. In order to have a productive agricultural economy, we need a public drainage law. The law gave very broad authority to landowners and to local jurisdictions to make this happen. It is mainly a prescriptive uh, statute, meaning there are no rules that require uh, other things to be done. The statute stands on its own. It describes how drainage proceedings are undertaken, what a petition process looks like, what the jurisdiction of a, a given group of counties or county or uh, watershed district might look like. There is due process built into this law. It provides for notification of adjacent landowners and a decision of the public, but it is heavily weighted toward maintaining drainage rights. It is organized for the sake of promoting agricultural drainage. Now, things have been changed over the years to respect conservation, fish and wildlife habitat, downstream flooding, uh, potential for impact of water quality, but nothing really has dramatically altered the fact that it promotes organized drainage, subsurface or above ground. That's still the law of our land. It was, there's a plaque about government ditches, the draining of Minnesota. You can see it right there. There were tile lines dug by hand. There were tile and ditching equipment that dug major channels uh, through the peatlands of Northern Minnesota. This uh, is a, a map of Meeker and Candiohi County showing how the uh, channels and ditches and tiles were organized and constructed into this system but there is no organized inventory of all public drainage in the state of Minnesota. There is no such thing. Some jurisdictions have assembled maps and information about uh, their, their drainage systems. Many have not. There are no construction records. It's not like wastewater infrastructure or drinking water infrastructure or road infrastructure where you have plans and as-built conditions some places that exist, but not uniformly. Many people have criticized the law for not having that requirement that we have an exact uh, knowledge of what uh, was allowed. So this is kind of the result. These, are, these red channels are places where things have been altered. They were original water courses. They were some kind of a stream, but they've been modified through uh, action and uh, one of the most entertaining conversations I ever had to have when I was a DNR hydrologist was define an altered water altered natural water course. It's a contradiction in terms, but it exists in law an altered natural water course. Okay, so if you put natural water course together and then you alter it, that makes sense. But you always had to unpack it for people because if you say altered natural water course enough times, they think you're crazy. Today's challenge is the pattern uh, tile drainage that's going on throughout 
uh, agricultural landscapes. And you can see this whenever you drive across farm country, anywhere in Indiana, Ohio, uh, Iowa, Minnesota, southern part of Wisconsin, anywhere there's active farming because it's just too good of an investment for uh, reducing risk to agricultural crops. Drying out the soil profile within 24 hours to save the agricultural productivity of, a, of the soil as well as protecting the crop. So this is going on and this is a, a map showing how uh, old drainage systems are modified to uh, uh, install more patterned tile drainage. I wanna say a little bit here about Minnesota's riparian buffer law because this applied to ditches. You might recall it was wildly unpopular uh, law that passed while I was commissioner of the PCA. I did not have to lobby for this law. Thank goodness it was not in my backyard. Uh, although I was very happy to see that we got this law passed. Uh, it required uh, uniformity in agricultural uh, and all waterways of a 50 foot or more or less, depending on uh, performance of, of the buffer but of permanent vegetation adjacent to these waterways in our state. It does not necessarily uh, benefit water quality, but it does stabilize stream banks from, a, from a sediment uh, creation through erosion and so forth. The fun fact on this one is that we're about 90%. We're above 90% compliant statewide. So it's been a practice widely known since the 1930s, uh, since the Dust Bowl period, and it is something that uh, uh, farmers were doing in many respects across the state and now they're uniformly doing it. And uh, I think it's been a, uh, it's a big credit to the, to the farm community that they've taken this action and are complying. I mentioned the Dust Bowl. That was a significant period for water law in the state of Minnesota. Not, not federal law, but for, uh, it was for the creation of the Soil Conservation Service and and the related uh, efforts of federal government that came about at that time. But in Minnesota, this is the period where public waters were defined. I said that earlier, 1937 is when public waters were defined. They were uh, navigable waters of the United States plus anything else that had a significant beneficial use or purpose. Okay, so that was a wide ranging definition. Why did the legislature need to define public waters? because lands were being sold as they dried out during the drought for building, for development, and for other purposes. So you had to identify the containers uh, so that they were not uh, encroached upon by development. There was a permit requirement for alteration, and these are specific words, the course, current, or cross-section of public waters. That was put into law in 1937. They were permits issued by the state Department of Natural Resources. I had the pleasure of uh, working on those permits in my early career. There was also a law passed that said a permit would be required for water use and appropriation. Now this is based on riparian water law, not uh, Western uh, appropriation doctrine. So, but it is modified slightly. Our riparian law in this state is prioritized. So you, the state can eliminate your permit or suspend your permit under drought conditions if water is unavailable during a given period of time, during a drought. That was what was uh, adopted into law and adjusted over the years. The original law was uh, water use and appropriation, just to make sure we had a record keeping system for who was using water. This was waters of the state, by the way, not just public waters. So this was underground waters and above ground waters. At the same time, 91 soil and water conservation districts were formed. How many, how many counties in the state of Minnesota? I just said it, students have to answer this, you guys. How many counties? 87. Why are there 91 soil and water conservation districts? You get the gold star. Some of the bigger counties were too big to have just one soil and water conservation district. There's a North South St. Louis County uh, and, a, and a South. Same with Otter Tail. They broke some of the counties in, in half and said, we need more than one. The federal government at this time began funding water pollution control at community wastewater treatment systems. And this is in the 1940s, ultimately when the State Water Pollution Control Board was formed uh, by the state of Minnesota. And their job was to set standards for water quality for treatment of sewage discharges 
and to make sure that there was uh, fair pricing around the labor laws. So if you look at the original pollution, uh, water pollution control board uh, regulations and laws, it had a lot to do with contracting and pricing of contracts to make sure that there was one community was not getting gouged where another wouldn't and uh, that labor relations were handled correctly. It's a picture of Aldo Leopold, one of the, one of the iconic uh, hydrologists of our nation who said that water is the most critical resource issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. I, am in, I was in that children's generation. So all of you who are younger than me, you're now children's children's generation. So if I still agree that it is that, uh, the most important issue of our lifetimes and that the health of our waters is a principal measure of how we live on the land. So land is always, it's all about what we do with the land. Just a, another fun fact of all the irrigation water in Minnesota, 90% of it comes from groundwater. 10% that's not groundwater is wild rice diversion off of a few rivers in northwestern Minnesota is used for paddy grown wild rice. That's, that's where the surface water is used. There were, there were a total of about 12 farms when I worked at DNR that actually had surface water pumps in rivers that pulled water from rivers to irrigate farm fields. I don't know what the number is now. The basic problem with rivers is they are not predictable. And so the flow would vary and the uh, and keeping your pump operating, keeping your irrigation system operating was challenging. And so groundwater is much more reliable and easy to operate. Now let's step into public health. How many of you have heard the story of Dr. of John Snow? Hopefully everybody. Famous epidemiologist, London, period 1850s. There was a prevailing theory that cholera outbreaks were driven by airborne particles. John Snow started to inventory where all the diseases were actually occurring and started making a map kind of a georeferencing project of the 1850s. He then realized that the closer you got to the pump, the community well, which is shown in this now, uh, now a museum to John Snow's uh, life, uh, the more intense the disease was. And so he, he brought about the modern germ theory that water carried germs. Uh, cholera was transmitted through water transmission. And because there was so much shallow groundwater being pumped out of this well where waste was directly applied on into the sewers and there was, it was a nasty part of town, but this is when epidemiology and the, and the science of environmental public health really grew. The state health board was formed in 1872, the State Health Board was first officed in the city of Red Wing. I don't know why. I asked, I asked every commissioner that I ever knew from the health department, and they know, none of them know exactly why it was housed in uh, Red Wing, although there's a theory that the first commissioner of health lived there, and he didn't want to travel anywhere, so they organized the State Board of Health around the commissioner. Uh, and they were given this interesting authority which was not to set standards at a state level, but to really guide the implementation of public health practices, which were largely viewed as local responsibilities, community-based responsibilities. And if you ever interact with the Minnesota Department of Health, you'll, you'll learn that even today, the work of the health department is driven by community needs, community health assessments, community health boards, they do not take it as their primary responsibility to manage the state through the state health department without the leadership of local government and local community health boards. There are 54 community health boards in Minnesota. Those health boards define the needs of their community, drinking water protection all the way to disease and, and other uh, concerns of their community are, are ranked by, uh, by those health boards. That still carries on. But this, uh, the law that passed uh, in early 1900s and directions given from the health board included sanitary conditions. 
Life expectancy, as we all know, has dramatically increased simply because we've addressed hazardous substances in our environment, drinking water, exposure risks, uh, wastewater discharges, and uh, all forms of waste control. And so our current system of local health boards is now organized under the 1976 Community Health Services Act, the way that the health department still delivers its basic program services. Their law is organized under chapter 103 H and I, the two specific things that protect water are the, uh, the groundwater protection provisions where they can assess health risks, they can make sure that they have a uh, sampling protocol and treating uh, treatment inspection program for all of the 118 different contaminants that are either identified by the federal government or by the state government. They can establish construction standards. They perform these. I've, I had a hard time learning this when I went from being a permit uh, inspector to being a sanitary survey overseer. They're the same thing. You're inspecting. One, but they have a very different emphasis if you read it just by the words. A survey is to inform, an inspection is to require. The health department does not view a sanitary survey necessarily as what a permit inspector at the DNR or the PCA would look at. So when you go to work at these different uh, state agencies, as I have, you'll learn that there's a slightly different culture about the, the terms. They also oversee the construction of all wells and borings and to make sure that there are, and there are initial water quality tests. Again, a fun fact here is 75% of all Minnesotans drink groundwater supplied sources. That's your daily water supply. The 25% that don't are in the core cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul and surrounding suburbs. Some of the iron range communities that take water directly out of iron pits. Duluth that takes water out of uh, Lake Superior, and a few communities on the Red and the Red Lake River that drink water from uh, the, those rivers. Minnesota and Wisconsin are, are different as you, as you look to our east. More community water systems are driven by surface water. I personally think we need to have a lot fewer of us drinking groundwater in the future. It's too precious a commodity for us to use in that way. And I would love to see our laws change to prioritize surface water use going forward. Let's talk about the period of environmental awakening in, uh, in, from 1960 to 1980. The, all kinds of laws were written during this period of time. Many of them I don't have time to talk about today, but one I will talk about because I was employed by the Pollution Control Agency is, is the, the formation of the agency in 1967. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit more time about that. But all of these laws were passed to try to organize a basic premise, which is the land use is affecting the water. Flooding is driven by poor floodplain management. Uh, water quality problems on lakes are driven by poor wastewater treatment systems designed around lakeshore. And so the Shoreland Management Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, all of these things grew up in the late 60s and early 70s and the Minnesota Environmental Policy Act was passed at that same time when the Environmental Quality Board was created. This is just the side story that uh, those of us that work for the Pollution Control Agency love to show. The, the spill, the, this uh, picture on the left is uh, Honeymead, uh, which uh, was a soybean oil producer in, uh, in North Mankato. They had two tank failures, simultaneous tank failures which resulted in all of their stored soybean oil going into the Minnesota River, completely uh, devastating the oxygen demand in the river, killing all the fish, killing ducks. Uh, this pile of ducks that's in downtown St. Paul uh, was uh, emblematic of uh, Governor Rolvog there, Carl Rolvog in the, in the fedora. Uh, that guy was a resident of West St. Paul and was righteously indignant over the loss of all these uh, fish and waterfowl. He brought a basket of ducks to the Capitol Rotunda and dropped it down in the center of the rotunda in 1962, which led to the passage of laws around water quality protection in the state. And that's a little bit of the timeline around that period of time. Uh, there was a Richard's oil spill in, in Shakopee as well, which was another one that led to a major uh, waterfowl kill and fisheries 
uh, fish kill on, on the Mississippi River. Uh, so those two things, really the agency, the Pollution Control Agency and why it has its name was to control these tanks. That was a driving force behind the formation of, of the agency. It was about tank construction standards. Much like what happened in West Virginia not long ago when they had to focus on tank construction standards. So I want to talk a little bit about how Uncle Sam jumped into this game. Uh, these are all the various laws that the federal government enacted. Right in all of this conversation from a, from a water law perspective is, what are the state's rights? What does federalism mean? And what's the idea of cooperative federalism? Many of these laws, the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the Clean Water Act, even the Clean Air Act and the Resource Conservation Recovery Act and CERCLA, the Superfund laws, are all built on the idea that the federal government defines the boundaries and the states implement within those boundaries. The states have the responsibility for implementation, primacy it's called. It's called who's the primary implementer of the act. And that's a really important subject every time you talk about who's got what authority. Remember that the states have rights. The federal government has rights. This is why things like waters of the US has become such a contentious issue. Who's got the right to do what where? The federal government defines the game board the states have to implement. I am always glad that Minnesota has strong water law behind that preceded the Clean Water Act because we're not so vulnerable to change. Other states that have no state law related to water are beholding to the federal boundaries. That's all they've got. So if you have, haven't figured out, my opinion is we're better off without the federal government in Minnesota. If you ever want more of my opinion about that, I'm happy to share it. <laughs> but I will say that the EPA makes for some great cartoons. I mean, I, I just have to say, in all my time in state government, I loved having EPA out there because the cartoons were just better. They, without them, it would have had to be, you know, the state government getting, taking all these shots. You know, <laughs> let's make water safe again, let's, but, but, but part of my you know, career has been these three terms on, the, it's been an evolution. Back in younger period of my life, we used to talk about regulatory certainty. Wouldn't it be good if people could definitely know what kind of the outcome was gonna be and, and that would make things better? Or what about this idea of regulatory simplification that you know, it, should just, it shouldn't be this complicated. It should be a lot more streamlined than it is when we're talking about you know, a hydrologic system that no one quite knows the boundaries and dimensions of. And then this more recent one, which is regulatory humility, which I hate, um, but that's become popular. Like, I'm just a humble public servant. I'm gonna regulate you with humility, recognizing that you, the business owner, the community leader, have a much more knowledgeable and intense right to do something about water. I've, I'm offended by the term, and every time I hear it, I gotta say how offensive it is. So we're in the 1980s, 1990s, everything's chugging along very well until we get to this one little wastewater treatment plant permit that didn't go right for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency around 2003. They issued a permit for Annandale Maple Lake wastewater treatment plant expansion that would allow them to increase their pollution. They would offset that pollution at the Litchfield wastewater treatment facility. That was the plan. So we're gonna increase pollution over here within the same watershed. We're gonna offset it with some decreases than another one. Seems sensible, right? People said no. They took us to court. I wasn't there, so don't blame me. But Ed, you were there, right? Yeah, so Ed can blame Ed. No, the, uh, <laughs> but, but the idea was the court then decided, ultimately, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of the state of Minnesota that no, the Clean Water Act is plain. No one gets to increase pollution. The goal of the Clean Water Act is systematic reduction of pollutant loads through total maximum daily load limits, the recipe for how you're gonna get a watershed back to its, as close as possible to its natural conditions. 
This sent a really big shockwave inside government. And this is when those of you who started to hear about the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act, this is what started it. Because the theory was, if Annandale and Maple Lake can't expand their wastewater treatment plant, what's gonna happen at bigger cities? How are they gonna grow? The business community was where the shockwave hit. And they were the ones lobbying for a better solution. And that's what came of the Clean Water Legacy Act in 2006 and the constitutionally dedicated funds that came through the Clean Water Land and Legacy, which again, 56% of Minnesotans voted to increase their own sales tax to do this work, to better inventory and identify water quality challenges in our state. It generates $100 million a year, plus or minus, for 25 years. That's $2.5 billion, which is about the cost of the Fargo-Moorhead diversion project. Okay, just scale. Remember, people say $100 million a year for 25 years, that's a lot of money. You should be able to fix every water quality problem, every water problem everywhere in the state with that amount of money, right? Wrong. Because one flood control project costs that much. It's a big problem and they should fix the problem. I'm not arguing about Fargo-Moorhead. I'm just saying scale. Remember what it actually costs. PCA and all the state agencies are actively learning about all these watersheds and we have gathered 100% of the physical, chemical, biological data about every, 80, every one of those 80 watersheds in 10 years. People will say you spent too much time studying. I'd say the legislature was smart. They gave us 10 years to get this done and we did it. The state government and their partners in local governments got all 80 watersheds assessed. By the way, did you know this, that 56% number from that slide, there's some irony here. I'm not, I'm not sure how to, how to, you know, I guess the, the public health, the epidemiologist would tell me that's an association that has no causal relationship whatsoever. So you can't, you can't draw the line between them. But we are in a position now where we know the checkbook when Deb Swackhammer here was, was here at the university and the Water Resources Center, she would say, if you don't know the balance in every part of your checking account, your savings account, your groundwater system, your surface water system, how are you ever going to know what you're going to do to make it better? We now have a good checkbook balance on every one of our watersheds. I want to talk just quickly on a few more things. Local government has played a long-standing and important role. We had an insightful law in 1955 called the Watershed District Law, which was ahead of its time. It envisioned a, a time in which all of the land of Minnesota would be covered by a local jurisdiction that would have a watershed district uh, board of managers overseeing local decisions that would affect water. We, we have about 48 watershed districts in the state that cover about 20% to 25% of our landscape today. The good news is that we adopted a lot of other planning requirements and we filled some gaps with the 1991 Wetlands Conservation Act uh, but nothing is yet perfect from a, from a long-term standpoint, but I am very encouraged by this one law that passed in, uh, in the statute in 2014, which is called One Watershed, One Plan. It's a surrogate watershed district law. It gets us to the same result with a different approach. Rather than forcing a, 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 a unit of government approach on local governments, it forces them to come together around a plan so they can get the money. This is a smart idea for policy. Organize people to get money because they will follow the money, Jerry. That's what they like to do. So it does have the same effect of getting everyone organized around a watershed scale plan to do something at the local level. Groundwater protection. These are all the things that the Minnesota Groundwater Protection Act of 1989 does. It, it improved our groundwater protection statewide, but we're still limited in what we know. I would say two of the things that I think were most important about this is that it put uh, the emphasis on wellhead protection, which is about where people are gonna be harmed if we fail to protect groundwater. That's a, that's a significant accomplishment. And then the accelerated mapping and inventory efforts that are going on at the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, uh, Minnesota Geologic Survey, and their cooperation with the U.S. Geologic Survey. Just a few. I like Pat Shea. 
who's now at St. Paul. He used to be the public works director or the, the utility manager at, at St. Cloud's uh, Water Utility. He's now down in St. Paul. But uh, what we do with the land and how we protect our, our wellhead is all about our kids. And when you look at the proportion of nitrates found in unsafe levels, these are recent data from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. We are in um, uh, trouble with nitrates in groundwater in our state. And you can see it in their map. You can see where uh, they've had to restrict fall application of nitrate and manure because of it. You can see the places where DNR is thinking there is overuse of our uh, aquifers occurring already. Uh, and so groundwater is the issue of the future. And if, if I were thinking forward as if I were 22 starting at the DNR, imagining myself at 62, like I am today, I'd say, let's stop using groundwater. We have to get more people using a renewable system, which is our surface water resources for, for water supply. This is one of the better graphics of how everybody plays a part. All, all four agencies play a part in groundwater. DNR looks at levels and monitors water levels. Ag is focused on agriculture. PCA is focused on underground tanks and, and pollution. And the health department is making sure people have safe drinking water. Don't forget about Bowser, who makes sure we have local plans and that we incentivize uh, wellhead uh, protection. Next to last slide. How do we get where we are today? It was designed the way the statutes and the roles of state agencies, this, this relationship and many others among state government was designed in a memo written by Dave Durenberger in 1970 to Governor Harold Levander. He compared and contrasted two forms of governing our state in state government. One is organize everybody into one big agency like they did in Wisconsin. The other is separate them all, keep them all separate, and have them compete for resources and law. He recommended keeping it all separate. The separateness is what's produced the vast majority of the, of the law and the funding in our state, in my opinion, has been enormously successful. Complicated, no doubt. But that's why career bureaucrats like me can make a living trying to talk about these things. It has, we've got much to be proud of because we have a solid constellation of water laws. They may not be fully implemented or achieved yet, but we have a great foundation that many other states are enormously envious of, especially the funding that we have in the Clean Water Fund. Commercial for Freshwater Society. This is who we are, eight people doing, doing these four things. We do a very limited amount of research, applied research at the at the local level, but we build everything we do on science and public policy so, so that people can value and conserve water. And we are an organization you can contribute to. We are a 501c3. Uh, it's it's uh, any donations to freshwater are tax deductible. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to make this uh, maiden voyage presentation on water governance for me. Thank you. minutes for questions. Dave. Okay, thank you. That was really a good overview. Um, what are your thoughts about um, how laws could better take into account um, an increasingly wetter climate that we're facing and the effect that that's having on our water resources and our water quality? Well, there are, great question. First of all, I'll repeat it so people can hear. What, what are the ways, because with climate is changing, wetter climates, warmer climate, what, what laws could do to address that? First of all, I think our floodplain law is wrong. We have a hundred year uh, recurrence interval uh, as our basis for the regulatory floodplain. It's wrong. Uh, it needs to be reviewed and that's a national problem. So first of all, I would say that many of the things that we designed to be resilient in 1965 to 1985 are not. So that's one problem. The second problem is uh, designing for resilience. The, the construction standards of many of our infrastructure facilities, both on the wastewater side, drinking water side, roads, bridges, and anything else hydrologic needs to be adjusted. And I think we need to 
look at uh, the facts more soberly and increase the uh, sort of the uncertainty factors in what we apply for construction of facilities. And then lastly, I would say that we need to start uh, thinking in what I would consider more scenario-based planning for water resources rather than uh, objective planning, where we think that we know that something that we could, I, I think of my days in, in doing wastewater, you know, on-site septics. And we think that, you know, the, the, the groundwater levels are predictive. You can be predictive about groundwater levels based on what you can observe in the soil. That may be true still, but it's not necessarily true when the overall climatological system is changing. So we need to think about ways we incorporate indicators in our plans for greater amplitude in our climate uh, and our hydrologic systems. So those are things from my chair that I would, uh, that we advocate for is just the idea that we're gonna have to start thinking intentionally about recharge, for example, uh, and how we make uh, better decisions about land use based on recharge of our aquifers. It's another problem with um, trying to make sure we don't overutilize groundwater resources. Yes. How do you talk about your idea? Let's in 50 years, let's go to surface water for drinking water, which is a the primary thing the public thinks about what they want water they want. So how do you work with partnerships around conservation? Because a lot of the wildlife and mm -hmm. forests and all of the plant life is working with surface water. Right. So I actually, that's a great question. How do we move away from groundwater dependency for, for water supply and towards surface water? Um, and, and if we do, at the cost of all the conservation goals that So my, the conservation goals I don't think would be the first to suffer. I think it's urban challenge first. There's underutilized capacity at both the major uh, water treatment plants in St. Paul and Minneapolis. So that those systems were designed for much more flow than they're currently utilizing. I would start at the core and work out. There's available, there's available capacity in the existing infrastructure. It's a major public works program to take uh, pumps and pipe and transport that water to the suburbs, but that's where I would begin. I would not try to mess up greater Minnesota's reliance on their historic infrastructure until we can demonstrate that there's a better system of using surface water at the scale where the densest populations live. So that's my, that would be my approach. Don't, I'm more interested in the core urban areas being surface water supplied because that's where we're going to grow. All the demographic data shows that our expansion for demand of water supply is going to come first at uh, the core cities. Sir. Earlier in your talk, you talked uh, about the drainage laws and how it allowed coalitions to force drainage on other yeah. properties. What precedent does that set for um, coalitions about rewetting the environment? So that's a super interesting question. If you have this drainage law that empowers people to it's not, I, I use strong words, but lawyers would argue with me about this. You can't condemn someone's land, but you have the authority to compel them to change what they're doing. They still have the land, but they have to allow you to put the ditch across their land. Flip it in reverse is what you're suggesting. What if we try to utilize something similar to incentivize, I would view it as more of a, let's learn from our past that that was done with a very strong message from the government that said draining land is productive, it's needed, it's valued, and society generally agreed with that premise. So first we need society to agree that storing water back on the landscape is the desired result, that it's a higher priority than pushing water downstream. If we could get that policy, we don't need new policy because chapter 103A, if you want to read any chapter of state law, read chapter 103A. All the policies for water are laid out there. You can make a case that we're violating every one of them or that we're successfully implementing every one of them. There's argument on all sides. 
but there is one on rainwater that said, it is the policy of the state to conserve rainwater where it falls. We don't. You know, you can make an argument, people will, that, well, that we do, we just sort of have to move it over here a little ways, and then we do. But if you read the plain language of the law, the value of the statute, the policy says, conserve water on the land where it falls. We could reemphasize that and utilize the drainage law provision sort of in reverse. I agree with that, but you need dramatic change in public support for that to happen. It's a principle that would work. It's like many things. The idea is great. Can it be implemented takes people's will and politically that's hard to gain. Yes. So I have a historical curiosity kind of question. So uh, it seems like Minnesota is ahead of other states in terms of protecting water quality. So I was wondering if this was true in the past as well. So uh, what would be Minnesota's related contribution in making the federal government the ocean actually pass the Clean Water Act compared to other states? Um, Minnesota was not, um, there were, political actors in the Clean Water Act debate from Minnesota. That would have been during the period of uh, uh, Walter Mondale being in the Senate. Uh, there would have been strong democratic leadership from the state of Minnesota in the early 70s, but it was by and large, the Clean Water Act was, was vetoed by President Nixon originally, and his veto was overridden by Congress. So everyone likes to say, oh, the Clean Water Act was passed during a Republican administration only over the president's dead body, <laughs> really. I mean, that, that's just the way it was. So the idea that Minnesota was a leader, I think we helped contribute to it. But I would, I would say this, this has been, I'm not saying it from personal experience, but it's after reflecting and talking to a lot of our political leaders that Minnesota values Minnesota's solution more than anybody else's. So we decided to pass a lot of water laws during the 30s that most other states did not pass. We passed other laws during the early 60s before the federal government passed the Clean Water Act. We valued our laws more than we valued the federal government's laws. And you see, you hear that in me. I value our ability to control and influence our water much more than I trust the federal government's. And I personally believe that's a better model of achieving water quality goals and any water goals. It's like politics, all water is local. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of state control. So I don't like that we have the federal government still issuing uh, 404 permits. Now there are many nonprofit leaders and environmentalists who will argue that point with me, but I believe we would do a better job of being unhitched from the federal government when it comes to regulatory decisions when it, on, on wetlands, for example. Well, maybe not because you're a headwater state. We are a headwater state. That's why we can do something like that. That's a very valid point, Peter. Wouldn't you want the federal government to be involved in health and it's like it's like if you were a down downwind air pollution problem state. If you were in Maryland and Delaware and you're getting the pollution from Pennsylvania and Kentucky and Tennessee, yeah, you don't you can't control the discharges of that air quality over your state. That's a different scenario. My point is I favor a solution for Minnesota that we could be far more protective in my mind if we were not hitched up with the federal government. That's my personal opinion, it would take time. Yes, sir. You had mentioned just a few minutes ago that you were proponents of uh, holding water on the land. And I can understand that maybe you had a lot more wetlands in the pre, uh, you know, people who moved over here in this landscape. But that was a dry climate. If you start holding more water on the land in the present climate, you probably seen a scene behind the same valley where the whole hillside yeah. came down. Yeah. 
and it should make the soil so bad. We're going to have a lot more nitrogen going through the soil as well as we're going to have landslides along the rivers. That's going to create more problems. Yeah, there are there are challenges. I I personally here's here's the thing that I spent zero time during my professional life thinking about is the water. I I don't know what the what the correct uh, term for it is, but it's the water that's in transit in the soil. So there's a there's a block of water in our hydrologic system that's moving from the surface through the soil to the groundwater. That's the water that I didn't think about ever. And my regret is that we didn't plan wisely. I'm not begrudging the, the need to do something about that water because of productivity of soil for, for crops, but we did not plan it. We just did the easiest thing. It's like we, we, we built the tile system to meet the, well, it's in many cases, it doesn't meet the ditch grade because you still have to pump it. There's plenty of drainage systems that are pumping water to, to manage drainage. So I would love to see the future look differently about soil health and productivity and how how that water in the soil column is managed. To me, that's a great opportunity for um, holding water during periods of wet to manage it for the future. I don't know what that would entail, but it certainly sounds better to me than just eliminating it and then not having it available in the future. Not stored in the soil. It's going to eventually, you got a granite underneath it, eventually it's going to go to the river. Of course. I'm saying there's a period of time where that water is held in the soil that it could be um, beneficial for the future. And you could manage it as a system. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Um, so if you could share this, so back to what you were talking with Dr. Kayla about, um, so would you have the same opinion about the state government being the main governing body for in like Louisiana or Mississippi or something? That, if you care to share. That, that's a hard, that's a hard um, comparison to make because I'm not, I'm not, never been a downstream, you know, I've never been the recipient. So I, I wish I could answer that, but I don't have a strong view of it. However, having, having lived in the shoes of, you know, a floodplain management, I was early in my career, that was my job, was reducing flood damages. And, and one state, Minnesota, put a lot of effort into eliminating flood damages through acquisition and, and uh, flood protection measures. Louisiana didn't do so much on that. So that sense of local responsibility, I think, um, should be normalized at a state's level. Not saying that I can do anything to prevent or change the fact that Louisiana is the, you know, the bottom of the watershed, but they should have some level of state responsibility, more than what I saw certainly during the floodplain management program, which was development goes in, development gets flooded, Development goes back in. Development gets flooded. Development goes back in. That's irresponsible. So I would want to see when it comes to states' rights, this is where I think the federal government falls down. The federal government doesn't hold a bar high enough for states. Not that I'm not trying to be just proud of Minnesota. I am proud, but I also think that it's the system is weak at the federal level in that regard. Sorry, you had a question. Is moving how the federal regulations are just not strong enough? And like, why is that the federal regulations? If you want more, the state can add more. But what about the federal regulations? Like, hold the state back from adding more. So I would say that because the federal regs, for example, on on wetland permitting on on Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which is discharges of fill into into waters of the U.S because those requirements are not ours to define. We will never have the ability to debate what the level of those standards should be. 
Now, that's theoretical. Um, in the past, most of the time, the federal government was equal to or more restrictive than state governments. We're entering a period where the federal government is becoming less restrictive than many states' governments. I don't have a problem with that, but what I do have a problem with is the state's not stepping in to fill that void. We happen to have a Wetlands Conservation Act that I would argue is more effective than the Section 404 of the Clean Water Act is. Now again, many environmentalists will take issue with this because they think that everything is too weak and that's their prerogative. My prerogative is local people should make these decisions because local people living with local decisions make stronger decisions. Schools go up and down that way. Uh, roads and, and local infrastructure go up and down based on local people. So I'm a strong proponent of local rights driving uh, the action and states then adopting that sort of mindset that we're gonna, we're gonna take responsibility. I personally think that's a more effective governance system than having a single, and it goes back to my, you know, my conversation with Dave Durenberg, why I took the picture with him the other day, was because he was in favor of forcing the state to have a system that worked. I would like to see states have systems that work too. That's my personal philosophy. You think that each state will actually do that? I think if they had to, they'd have to answer that question. Right now, uh, if you go to another state that is wholly, uh, take Tennessee, they cannot adopt a water quality standard that is any more restrictive. Their legislature has passed this law. You cannot pass any water quality standard that's more restrictive than a federal water quality standard, period. That's what their laws say. So their people have spoken and they like the federal solution. It makes kind of opting out of responsibility. The federal system gives states permission, in my view, to opt out of responsibility. I don't like it and that's why I'll keep arguing about it. And we can <coughs> keep arguing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you, it's a, good, it's a good question and thank you for your, for your questions. Thank you. Please join us for a little reception out in the hall and we can continue these conversations. As much as uh, Minnesota. As much as anybody will argue. Yeah, let me, I, I'm just gonna stop right yep. over here. Hey, you guys, I'm Steve Cooper. Uh, 